sociopathic personality is a character behavior disorder that is marked by a lifelong pattern of misbehavior. The sociopath is an antisocial personality who is frequently in trouble, for he aims at immediate satisfaction of his own desires without regard for the consequences, and he does not learn from either experience or punishment. He appears to feel little anxiety and little or no sense of distress. His loyalties are superficial and unreliable, and he has been called the man without a conscience. As a result, the sociopath is a continuing problem to the military, consuming time, energy, and emotion, and generally causing problems wherever he goes. The sociopath is committed to no one except himself. He is truly the uncommitted man. Walter Rexford was one such individual. Gregory Unger was another. However, not all sociopaths are alike, and identification is not always easy. In this film, you will see the reenactment of two case histories that trace the type of lifelong behavior typical of these troublesome individuals. Hi, Peg. What is it, Greg? What about tonight? What do you say? Well, I was going to wash my hair. Oh, come on, Peggy. Don't you have to be somewhere, Greg? Won't you get in trouble? No one is going anywhere until I get there. What about tonight? Are you sure you can get off? No sweat. Well, okay. Pick me up at eight. <laughs> you bet I will. Uh, wear something cool. But sure I will. <sighs> See you at eight. the motor pool. Motor pool, Sergeant Janicek speaking, sir. May I help you? This is Colonel Arnold. Let me speak to your CO. Colonel Arnold at headquarters. Lieutenant Little speaking, sir. I've been waiting outside the command building. Where's my car? That vehicle has been dispatched, sir, and should be there now. I've got an important meeting with the commanding general. Now get somebody over here on the double. I'll send another immediately. Unger again. Let's wait outside. Corporal Gregory Unger was charming and intelligent. While he had the capacity for college, he had never applied. Instead, after high school, he had worked at two or three civilian jobs. He joined the army impulsively after an argument at home. In basic training, he was a good soldier. After basic, he was assigned to a motor pool. But there, he soon became involved in a series of minor infractions. He became known for unpaid bills. On several occasions, he went on sick call, complaining of a headache and stomach upset that looked like an ordinary hangover. A sociopath is rarely recognized as the result of one or two actions. Instead, he is identified when a continuing pattern of disruptive behavior emerges. Gregory's behavior was typical of such individuals. Sir, where have you been? The car overheated. That's no excuse. Yeah, but the block would have busted. It would have split. All right, let's get going. We're yes. late. Yes, sir. As often happens in such cases, the sociopath's troublesome behavior was made up of a series of minor incidents. I, 
I'd like to request permission to see the lieutenant. Uh, my mother's real sick. Sir. What is it, Sergeant? Corporal Unger requests permission to speak with you. All right. Okay, Lieutenant, we'll see you. Thank you, Sergeant. Corporal Unger reporting, sir. The Colonel phoned because you were late, Corporal. Sir, I'd, I'd like to request an emergency leave. My mother's real sick. M my sister just called. Excuse me, sir. <clears throat> He's night driver this week. Sir, I, I've just got to be there. She's all alone. Check with the CO, will you, Sergeant? Yes, sir. Sir, I give you my word. She's real bad. If I could leave right now, I'd really appreciate it. Come back in a couple of hours, and I'll have an answer for you. Come in, Unger. Good afternoon, sir. What are you up to, Unger? The old man checked through the Red Cross, and they tell us your mother's no sicker now than she's been for months. Did you really think you were going to get away with this? Your request for leave is denied. Sir, I've just got to get home. She's Although a sociopath sick. may, on occasion, appear to be very angry, it is probable that the intensity of his anger is largely play-acting, an outward display of rage which represents an effort to manipulate another person. Control usually returns quickly to the sociopath because his anger is actually shallow and superficial. Sometimes the sociopath seems to be almost looking for trouble. In this instance, after being refused leave, Gregory not only went AWOL, but proceeded to get violently and publicly drunk. Oh, you remember John. Oh, you've never met. John, this is Greg. It's over there. Greg, hi, John. How you know Peggy. Yeah, yeah, we know each other. Long time. Long time. <laughs> Moreover, at the first opportunity, he got into a fight. Oh, your wife's got Greg, don't be stoked. After spending several hours with the military police, Gregory was ordered back to his company area. Unger, you've been given every chance to prove yourself, but you continue to get into trouble. In the company, on your job, and now fighting in town. Now you get out of here and get to the barracks, and you stay there until I call for you. You're dismissed. As the sociopath's behavior mushrooms from minor infraction to major infraction, he demands the time and attention of more and more people. And from a management viewpoint, as he becomes increasingly troublesome, so he becomes increasingly difficult to handle. Sergeant, let's call mental hygiene and let's see what they can do to help us with this guy. In response to the inquiry from the company commander, a social work specialist was dispatched to the company area, where he began an evaluation by interviewing Gregory. The specialist collected the information required for a social history, Gregory's pre-enlistment background and his military career up to that time. Then the specialist asked questions designed to bring out Gregory's feelings about his situation. Now, uh, the CO has told me about the recent difficulty you had. I'd like to get a better picture of it. Why don't you tell me what happened? Well, I got this call that my mother was real sick, and I tried to get an emergency leave. But the old man, he turned me down because the Red Cross didn't check it out right. I got so P.O.'d, I just took off. And that's all there was to it? Well, this outfit is so chicken, I just couldn't take it anymore. 
What makes you think this outfit is chicken? Well, for one thing, they jumped all over me because I was passing the PX when the car overheated. I called them and I told them about it. But they've just got it in for me. Why? Because I was having a cup of coffee while I was waiting for it to cool down. But if I would have driven it back to the motor pool that way, the block would have split. What else has been going on? Oh, a lot of little things. Like the other day, this joker who bunks next to me complained that I lifted his shaving cream. The next thing you know, they're making a big federal case out of it. I thought he was my buddy. I only borrowed a little of it because I'd run out. Do you suppose what you're doing has anything to do with the way they've been acting? Listen, in every outfit there's a fall guy, and in this one it's me. Didn't I keep that engine block from splitting? And look at the thanks I get. The identification of a sociopath requires a complete and detailed case history so that a pattern of behavior can be clearly recognized. In this instance, after interviewing Gregory, the social work specialist spoke next with the motor sergeant. Now about this Unger. He's been crying in your ear, has he? Well, I've talked with him. That guy is an eight ball from way back. Well, what does he do to get you so teed off? What doesn't he do? He steals from the other guys in the barracks. He calls up from the PX saying the vehicle is overheated, and when we check it out, there's nothing wrong. He makes a colonel late for an appointment with a general because he's, uh, who knows what he's doing. But what happens when you chew him out? Nothing happens. I read the riot act to him and he just stands there with that silly grin on his face and says, I won't do it again. And then he goes right out and fouls something else up. As motor pool officer, I'm sure you've had personal contact with Corporal Unger. You bet I have. I've talked to him, counseled him repeatedly. Nothing works. But the way he's acting, I'm afraid he's on a collision course for a court-martial. I called mental hygiene to see if you people have any ideas how I can get through to this character. Captain, is there any one thing he does that stands out? Anything that particularly impresses you? No, look, it's something new all the time. I've had trouble with him about money. He owes small sums, two, three dollars, to a lot of people in the company. Right now, I've got a letter on my desk from a jeweler he owes for a wristwatch. About a month ago, he burned out a transmission, I think just from abusing the vehicle. So it's nothing in particular, just a lot of little things. Oh, that's right. Now, he's a good mechanic. He knows his job. And sometimes he even does it. I've tried riding him hard. I've tried the fatherly approach. I've tried threats. Now, I don't know what else to do with this guy except relieve him of duty one way or another. When necessary, the social work specialist will also collect information from a soldier's buddies and, with his permission, from his family and friends at home and from anyone else the specialist feels might be helpful. In Gregory's case, a civilian employer provided some valuable background material. The social work specialist then reported the facts of the case to a social work officer. All in all, this hunger has a rather spotty record. Now, he's done pretty well in some areas. He completed high school. And the big thing to me is that he held a job as an auto mechanic for 14 months before he came into the service. So at least he has some success behind him. Well, he's had some trouble with truancies, but not enough to get him into any serious difficulties. Ever since he came into the Army, he's been getting into progressively more trouble. It all seems to be mushrooming. You mean like this last bit? Exactly. His CO has just about had it. Did you get much in the way of discrepancies? There were a great many contradictions between what Unger told me and the accounts of the other men in the company. Now, he likes to explain things glibly away that just aren't that simple. Take that story about his mother. 
In turn, the social work officer discussed the case with the psychiatrist. Oh, yeah, one other thing. He has a girl at home, and he's been writing to her regularly twice a week since he came into the service. Well, it seems to be a typical character behavior disorder of moderate severity. There are some good points here. Completing high school, civilian work record, and his relationship with that girl. However, there's not much question that his behavior is getting more and more in the way of satisfactory duty. I think it'd be a good idea to get together with a CO to see if some plan of management can be worked out. Sounds good. Do you have any uh, other opinions along this line? Well, it seems to me that he needs constant supervision one way or another. Mm -hmm. Depending on the severity of the disorder, there are a number of recommendations that can be furnished to military commanders. Well, I think that about covers it. I think it'd be a good idea if he went over to the motor pool and talked to Lieutenant Little about this. Once the problem has been definitely identified as that of a sociopathic character behavior disorder, it is possible for personnel of the Mental Hygiene Consultation Division and the man's military superiors to work together and determine the type of management that is appropriate. In those instances where there is sufficient evidence of positive factors, rehabilitation may be attempted. Where these factors are not evident, separation from the service is usually advisable. With all the facts in hand, successful management of the moderate sociopath is often possible. Let's look now at another case history. Walter Rexford was a 27-year-old Spec 5, a personnel specialist with eight years of military service. He turned himself in to the military police after a two-day AWOL, claiming to be suffering from amnesia and to be so confused and depressed that he did not want to go on living. He was taken to the hospital emergency room for a complete physical. There were no indications of organic disease. However, since Walter appeared extremely depressed, he was admitted to the psychiatric ward. The initial interview was conducted by a social work officer. I suppose something like this has been coming for a long time. I don't know what's the matter. I've just been following everything up, haven't done anything right. When you say a long time, how long do you mean? Well, the past two, three months. I'm trying as hard as I can, but I'm just not cutting the mustard. I'm a lousy husband. Never take my wife out. Lousy father. Never spend any time with the kids. For all the good I've done, there's no reason for me to be alive. It'd been better if those guys had killed me. The men who robbed you? Just exactly what did happen? Well, we got paid on Tuesday and I started home. I parked in the shopping center and cashed my check in the supermarket. I was feeling so bad, I decided to have a drink in the tavern there. All I remember was having three, four beers. I wasn't drunk. And then starting home. But while I was walking through the parking lot, someone must have come up behind me and slugged me. Next thing I re knew, uh, I woke up in the back seat of my car and it was Friday morning, today. During the initial interview, Walter's behavior appeared to be consistent with that of genuine depression. He was referred to a psychiatrist for further evaluation. I woke up on the floor of the back seat. I must have been there that whole two days. You can't remember anything at all about those two days. I've tried, sir, but it's, it's just one big blank. I, I just must have blacked out. I see. Well, in cases like this, your memory has a chance of returning. Right now, let's go on to this depression you've mentioned. Yes, sir. Well, I'll do anything to help get over this feeling. You said you were down in the dumps. Tell me about that. What do you want to know? Well, when did you start feeling lousy? Did you ask for any help or 
talk things over with anybody. I just can't remember things very well. I don't believe I talked to anyone, though. I thought I could work things out myself. By yourself? Well, I didn't want anything on my record. I see. Do you think there are any family problems involved in all this? I don't know. I know I haven't been spending much time with him, and I feel bad about that. I know I should be home more, but... Well, I've been so down in the dumps. We're shorthanded in the office. I've been putting in all this overtime. I'm carrying the whole place myself. I try to get home, but... my wife just doesn't understand it all. Well, if you were really concerned, why didn't you go straight home after you cast your paycheck? It was just an impulse. I, I thought the beer would help. Well, I suppose you could have bought it and drunk it at home. Oh, yeah, my wife doesn't like me to drink around the house. She's a real tiger about that. You seem to be having quite a difficult time. How did things go before you got in the Army? I was never in any trouble before. That's why I'd like to get this straightened out now. Trouble? Oh, I must be in some kind of trouble. I mean, I don't remember anything. Been unconscious in that car from Tuesday night to Friday morning. You turned yourself into the MPs and they brought you directly here? When did you have your last meal? Well, Tuesday, I guess. They said you weren't hungry when you were admitted. Well, I, I guess I've been too depressed. Where's your wife now? I guess she's at home. Well, have you called her since you turned yourself in? She must be worried. I haven't had a chance. The MPs brought me right here. I've just been going from one office to another. Hey, can I call her now? Yes, there's the phone out in the hall. Thanks. While a complete case history is necessary, mental hygiene personnel can often make an early educated guess. Some of the most valuable information is often collected by the social work officer from members of the patient's family, from his military unit, and from his records. Captain Law speaking. Captain Law, this is Captain Calder from the hospital. We've got a man of yours here on the ward, Spec 5 Rexford. Yes? We'd like to get some of your observations on the man. Well, what'd you have in mind? Well, how's he getting along in the unit? Oh, very well, I guess. He uh, does good work. But he seems to have a lot of uh, personal problems. Well, what kind of problems? Well, it's... Uh... Hard to say, uh, little things. Uh, well, I hear people talking about him in the orderly room. And there have been a couple of letters of indebtedness. None of it seems to bother him much, though. Well, how does he get along with the other men in the unit? Mm, very well, I, I think they like him. But he, he seems preoccupied, not always with it. Say, how, uh, how long are you going to keep him? I, I don't have anyone to replace him. Well, it's, it's hard to say. Tell me, has he been depressed much lately? No. If he were, I think I'd know about it. He's the uh, practical joker in the office. Has he seemed depressed lately, Mrs. Rexford? Depressed? I haven't noticed anything. Not like the party, Walter. He tells us he's been having some problems at home with his drinking. You mean? Does he drink much at home? Huh. I'd give anything if he would. Then at least the children would get to see him part of the time. I see. Tell me, has he had problems with memory? Blackouts, that kind of thing? No. 
Not unless you count broken promises. Further inquiries into Walter's background produced other inconsistencies. He had dropped out of high school after a history of petty trouble. He had a civilian work record that was equally inadequate. When his teenage girlfriend had become pregnant, he had promised to marry her and allowed plans to be made for an elaborate wedding. Two days before the ceremony, he ran off impulsively and joined the army. His marriage two years later was equally impulsive. None of this was conclusive in itself. Many people have difficulties in school, break engagements, owe bills, or overdraw a bank account without being sociopaths. However, in Walter's case, a consistent pattern of behavior did emerge. At the same time that the social work officer was gathering background material, the psychiatrist consulted with a clinical psychologist. So anyway, George, in my opinion, this man doesn't appear to be genuinely depressed. And I doubt very much if this is a true amnesia. Well, if you'll send him along about 3 o'clock this afternoon, I'll test him. Okay, good. Thank you. The tests administered by a psychologist present a difficult situation for a sociopath to handle. He usually doesn't understand how the tests work, and it is hard for him to manipulate them. As a rule, a sociopath, even one feigning depression, will be challenged by intelligence tests and may score well above average. On the other hand, the attitude that he displays while taking personality tests may be very different. His responses may range from non-committal evasion to supercilious, facetious remarks to sneering arrogance. However, these tests, combined with the clinical observations of the psychologist, will usually produce a pattern consistent with the diagnosis of sociopathic personality. When the test results have been reported, the psychiatrist has further information to help him in arriving at a diagnosis. As a rule, a psychiatrist will not confront a sociopath with the results of the gathering of information and the testing. There is nothing to be gained by such a confrontation, as the sociopath does not seem to learn or benefit from this experience, and his future attitudes and behavior will usually continue unchanged. However, the psychiatrist may wish to test his diagnosis as the case progresses and to look into further inconsistencies. Couldn't remember a thing. Well, about these uh, last few days in the ward, how have you been feeling? Oh, okay. I'm getting along all right. I heard you've been doing some drinking in the ward. Oh, no, sir. I also heard that there was some gambling going on out on the sun porch. Sir, I give you my solemn word, that isn't true. We were playing cards just for fun. The money that was on the table was just some change for some cigarettes. Well, we wouldn't do All of the like information that, that is collected is usually brought better. together at a clinical conference. Now, George, we've got another one on our hands. The information that I've gotten is riddled with inconsistencies between what he reports and what other people say about him. Well, Dick, that certainly fits in with his tests. He was complaining about amnesia and poor memory, but I can't find any evidence of difficulty with memory or anything else. What about the depression? Did you find anything to support that? Well, on the MMPI, he exaggerated his symptoms, but there's nothing to show that he was really depressed. He seems to act out his feelings rather than turn them against himself, as you would expect in a depression. Well, I think this all fits together. And we're agreed that he possesses most of the features of a sociopathic personality. I think we have to concur on that. But what I find really remarkable about this case is the superficiality that is so very evident now. It was so adroitly concealed. That... Walter had the main characteristics of a sociopath. He was charming and seemingly capable of good work. However, he was generally untruthful unreliable and insincere much of the time. His emotions were shallow. He seemed unconcerned about anyone but himself. He was only superficially responsive to interpersonal relations. Walter had a history of antisocial behavior and a failure to follow any life plan. He possessed no insight into his actions and failed to learn by experience.
He seemed to believe that words were an exact substitute for reality, that whatever he said was true simply because he said it. The difference between the two case histories you've just seen is largely a matter of degree. While Walter had had reasonable success in his role of personnel specialist, and most of his trouble had occurred during off-duty hours, his failure to complete high school, his impulsive antisocial behavior, and his consistently erratic past history gave little or no promise of future improvement. The evaluation by mental hygiene personnel was that Walter was a moderately severe sociopath, suffering from a basic personality disorder not easily treated in the military service. Walter was released from the hospital and ordered to return to his unit. A recommendation was made to his commanding officer that he be administratively separated from the army. Of the two men, Gregory had had the greatest difficulty in adjusting to the military. He had caused his superiors an almost endless amount of trouble. Nevertheless, Gregory offered by far the greater hope for rehabilitation. His completion of high school, his civilian work record, his ongoing relationship with the girl at home raised the hope that a new job offering greater satisfaction and less temptation, plus closer supervision and a different attitude by his superiors, would make it possible for him to adjust to the military and complete his tour of duty successfully. From the standpoint of military personnel, identification of the sociopath and an estimate as to the severity of the condition is the critical factor. Only then can military commanders arrive at sound judgments as to how best to handle these troublesome character behavior disorders.